was in university, they taught us that you, in the skin you have stratum germinativum, stratum, uh, stratum granulosum, stratum corneum. The top of the skin is cornified epithelial tissue. It's dead. If the tissue on the top of our skin wasn't dead, we would die because it protects, because it's dead, it's impermeable to solar radiation and it's impermeable to various toxins and to infectious microbes and bacteria in the atmosphere. So if the top of our skin wasn't dead, we would be dead. The only thing the cosmetic industry does is, is embalm a corpse. It sh shows you how to give the impression that the skin is alive by, by rehydrating it when in fact it's dead. That's all it does. <laughs> if the skin wasn't dead, you'd be dead. Well, that's, you know, <laughs> that's, that's the simple, it's a simple, simply stated. If the skin wasn't dead, we'd be dead. Well, that's the way the world does. It tries to make something dead look alive. In order, to make, in order to make something look alive, which is actually dead. You understand? And that is what their religions do. That's what their religions do. Every, every week on Thursday in the Belfast Telegraph, the big they put an advert in the Telegraph and it says something like, come see our beautiful building. <laughs> the Mahal is a beautiful building. The Mosque of Omar is a beautiful building, the Dome of the Rock on the Temple, they're beautiful buildings. And they're demonic. They set up monuments to selves. Monuments to self. They get into building their empire. Now when you want to build an empire, you need numbers and you need money. We never put, our ministry, Moriel, has never, by God's grace, not once, have we ever put numbers or money before biblical truth? We always put biblical truth first and trust God for the money. If we lose people, fine. We never put numbers and money before truth. But these guys will put numbers and money before truth. Why? They, because they're not building God's kingdom, they're building their empires. They set up monuments to self. That's what the papacy is about. That's what the Borgia Pope did, popes did in Italy. It's what the Medici popes did in Italy. They set up monuments to themselves. That's all it is. Verse 13, And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord, I have carried out the command of the Lord. They claim to be doing the work of God. But Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Nah. And Saul said, they bought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But the rest we've utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, wait and let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. He said, speak. And Samuel said, is it not true, though you were little in your own eyes, you were made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed you king over Israel? And the Lord sent you to go on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are exterminated. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but rushed upon the spoil and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord? We have a Hebrew phrase from the book of Proverbs, Evet Kimloach, Evet Kimloach. We normally think of it in terms of George Orwell's book, Animal Farm. When the animals overthrew the tyrannical farmer and the pigs took over and the pigs became worse oppressors than the old farmer. When a nobody becomes a somebody, look out. <laughs> he becomes worse than the old boss. The new boss becomes worse than the old. When a nobody becomes a somebody, look out. The only way a nobody can be a somebody is if he knows he's a nobody, like King David. <laughs> if the nobody knows he's a nobody, and says he's a nobody, like King David did, then a nobody can be a somebody. But when a nobody becomes a somebody, and now thinks he's a somebody, look out. Look at the Pentecostal ministry. Most of these men are uneducated. Now, I don't suggest you need a theological education to be in the ministry. It's an asset. If you can know, know Greek and Hebrew, it certainly is an asset. But I, it's, it's not a biblical qualification. Not knowing Greek or Hebrew was one thing, but some of these people can hardly read English, the way they take the Bible out of context. Again, the Pentecostal ministry, as I've said a number of times, in Australia, in New Zealand, in America, in England, 
Most of it. Now, there are exceptions. <clears throat> there are individual exceptions. But most, 90% of the Pentecostal ministry today, things like the Assemblies of God, it's a dumping ground for people who couldn't get an honest job. These men wouldn't have these kind of lifestyles and world travel and, 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 and five-star hotels. They wouldn't have this stuff if they weren't Pentecostal ministers. You think, you think they could be an oral surgeon? Or, or a top bonds trader on Wall Street, or you, you think you, you think they, 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 <laughs> they couldn't even get a good trade? Some of them, they, 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 just listen to them. Now, Peter was an uneducated man, but he was not unlearned in the Word of God. He was the, the apostles might have been fishermen, but they knew the Word of God. These people today are charlatans. The Pentecostal ministry is a dumping ground for people who are not good enough to make it in the secular world. So the Pentecostal ministry becomes a ticket to get a level of success that they could never get if they had to go out and get an honest living. Okay. That's what it is. It's just a joke. I'm, I'm a Pentecostal minister. Today, I, I am a moron. I went to Harvest Bible College. I'm an ignoramus. That's all it means. These are ignorant, ignorant people. Not just because they're intellectually inferior, they're spiritually inferior. Okay. Remember in the book of Acts chapter 4 verse 13, the apostles were uneducated, but where did they get this wisdom? These guys don't have any wisdom. They, they behave like what they are, nitwits. They, don't, they, they haven't got a clue. Watch out when a nobody becomes a somebody. Just listen to Rodney Howard Brown or Kenneth Hagin. These are grossly uneducated men. Now, D.L. Moody was an uneducated man, but he had the wisdom of God. You understand? He had the wisdom of God. These people only have a worldly wisdom and a demonic spirit in many cases. They set up monuments to themselves and when confronted, bah, what's this bleeding of the sheep I hear? I've done the work of the Lord, he says. And then he says again, verse 20, Then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord and went on the mission on which the Lord sent me and have brought back Agog, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Denial. Angry protest. When you confront these people, they will begin insisting they've done no wrong and insisting they did what God called them to do. And they become very angry about it. And the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. They just get angry. But when they can't deny it anymore, look what they do. Verse 21, But the people took some of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the choices of the things, and devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Verse 21, it says, he says the people did it. But verse 9 says, Saul and the people. The shepherd blames the sheep. Blame the people. If you've ever been to New Zealand, there's a lot of sheep. Find me one sheep that's afraid of the shepherd. A lot. Find me one shepherd that's afraid of a sheep. There's none. Let's look. And Samuel said, Has the Lord de as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying his voice? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of Kesem, divination. Rebellion is as witchcraft. And insubordination, as is iniquity and idolatry. Why is it called idolatry? Because he was building a monument to himself. His God was not God. God was just a ticket to put himself into a position of power and wealth that he couldn't get otherwise because he was a nobody. The same as most Pentecostal preachers today. The work of the Lord is just a ticket to put themselves into a position of power and affluence that they couldn't get if they had to go out and earn an honest living. So they corrupt the Word of God. 
That's all it is. Now let's continue. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he's rejected you from being king. No matter what somebody says, if they do not adhere to what's in the Bible, they've rejected the word of the Lord. When you reject the word of the Lord, you've rejected the Lord of the word. Jesus is the word. He is the Logos. He's the Mamre. He's the Devar. You reject what's in Scripture, you've rejected Jesus Christ. The rest is lies and deception. You reject what's in the Bible, you've rejected Jesus Christ. Then Saul said to Samuel, I've sinned, I've indeed transgressed the command of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and listened to their voice. False repentance and fear of man. I have never found a shepherd that's afraid of sheep. If somebody was this wrong, who really repented, he'd be willing to get out of the ministry. Lord, show me who you're going to put in my place, I'll support him. Now God is very gracious. David was willing to lay it all down. Don't hurt the people, don't hurt the sheep, it's my fault. When he, when, he, when he committed his second sin of numbering the people. It's my fault. Don't blame the sheep. That same God who forgave David is a very gracious God and may have forgiven Saul if Saul really repented. If anybody said there was nine persons in the Trinity and really repented, he'd get out of the ministry. It says in Timothy, you must be able to teach to be the Lord's minister. Now Benny said there was nine persons in the Trinity. When he got the comeback forward, he had to repent. Well, if he repented, he'd get out of the ministry. He'd say, I'm biblically not qualified to be in the ministry. He didn't repent. It was a false repentance. It was a false repentance. Just like Ahab, they always have a short and a false-lived repentance. And they come back even worse. What did Ahab do? He came back even worse after his repentance. Well, what, what, what did Saul do? Get even worse after his false repentance. What does Benny Hinn do? He gets even worse. Now Benny Hinn practices open necromancy. Several years ago, he used to say the ghost of, he used to go to the grave of Catherine Coleman or Amy Simple McPherson at Forest Lawn Cemetery in uh, Los Angeles. And Catherine Coleman, of course, took off with a married woman, a uh, married another uh, woman's husband. She ran off with the worship leader, a married man. He goes to get the anointing from her grave. That was several years ago. Not anymore. Last year on TV in America, he announced her ghost comes to him at night in his room. He is a familiar spirit. He's a necromancer. Yet people will accept it. They get worse. They don't get better. They get worse. Well, what happens? Now, therefore, in verse 25, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you. For you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. You've rejected the Lord, he rejects you. And as Samuel turned to go, Saul seized the end of his robe and tore it. The inevitable result of this is a split. When you see this pattern in your church, there must be a split. We make an idol out of unity. The unity the Bible teaches is the unity of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. He is not the Spirit of error. You cannot, by biblical definition, have unity of the Spirit with his error. Oh, but Jesus prayed we would be one. No, read the whole prayer. Don't take verses out of context like Satan did when he tempted Jesus. When you see people perverting texts out of context, not looking at the context, that's, that's the signature of Satan. When you see somebody doing that, they're either a babbling ignoramus or they're of the enemy. You're either listening to an ignoramus or a deceiver. Jesus prayed, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Then he prayed we would be one. If people are not set apart in biblical truth, there is no basis for unity biblically. 
there's a basis for ecumenical seduction, for deception, but not for unity of the spirit. False doctrine is meant to bring division. Romans 16, 17. Mark a factious man, the word is dikostasia, who departs from the teaching of the apostles, a dichotomy. You want to go that way? We're staying on the road to the biblical truth. We're going to heaven. You go that way. You are the factious man. You've departed from what the Bible teaches. We're not. 1 Corinthians 11, 19, we've said a number of times. Uh, there must be factions among you to prove which is true. The Greek word there for factions is heresies. Heresy. Heresy is meant to bring division. A split becomes inevitable. The fear of man. There's a lot of pastors and vicars who know Alpha courses are not biblical and don't work. Why do they have them? Well, they fear the people. People want it. We'll lose customers to the place up the street. A lot of them knew Toronto and all that was wrong. Why did they get it? Fear the people. Fear the people. When that happens, you need a split. We have to be careful of guilt by association. The Bible never teaches guilt by association, but it does teach guilt by cooperation. You shouldn't be involved with these people. All he wants, oh, I've sinned, I've sinned, but please don't let the people see it. You come with me. That's all they care about. If he really repented, he would say, okay, if God's going to give it to somebody else, I will step down and support him. Had he done that, who knows how gracious a gracious Lord may have been. God may have forgiven him and restored him. David was willing to totally repent. And David actually did something worse than Saul. And God forgave him. God looks for an excuse to forgive, but it requires something. Teshuvah, turning, repentance. A false repentance. Fear of people. Now, if you've seen that pattern in your church, you have no choice, biblically, there has to be a split. A denomination has that pattern, it has to split. What comes next? Then he said in verse 30, I've sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and go back with me that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel went back following Saul and Saul worshiped the Lord. Then Samuel said, bring me Agog, the king of the Amalekites. And Agog came to him cheerfully. And Agog said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. He came in bonds, it says in Hebrew. Cheerfully. Oh, the bitterness of death is past. Oh, we're friends now. Oh, the Reformation was a mistake. We can shake hands. Well, do you still believe that you have to atone in purgatory for your own sins? Or does the blood of Christ cleanse from all sin? Are you saved by being born again, or are you saved by sacraments? Is praying to the dead an abomination? Or is it the way to communicate with God? Is there one mediator between God and man, Jesus the righteous, or is there Mary? The Reformation is over. Oh, the bitterness of the past is over. We can shake hands and forget about it now? Or you repent of that stuff? No, they haven't repented of that stuff. The bitterness is not over. Rome believes what Rome has always believed. What has changed is not Rome. What's changed is evangelical Protestantism. You have witchcraft in the church. T today, it's not a King Saul, it's a Chuck Colson. It's a Pat Robertson. It's a J.I. Packer. It's a Bill Bright. It's those who sign up with Amalek. It was a Christian Missionary Alliance preacher in this country several years ago who gave me Peter Kreeft's book, Ecumenical Jihad. Peter Kreeft called for ecumenical union with Islam between saved Christians and Islam. Oh, Muhammad's in heaven. The book was endorsed by the Reformed theologian, J.I. Packer. It was endorsed by Satan's agent, Chuck Colson. Ecumenical union with Islam, a religion that says God has no son, which First John calls Antichrist? A religion that decrees death for becoming a Christian? 
Colston and Packer endorse it? You see what's happened. Amalek remains Amalek. You want to unite with Islam, you get a September 11th. You get Muslims rioting in the streets of Sydney. Amalek remains Amalek. God's rejected Saul. God's rejected Packer. God's rejected Robertson. God has rejected Colson. Maybe a backslidden church hasn't, but God has. There has to be a split. Well, what comes next? Look at the next chapter, 16, verse 14. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. Demonization. I will use the English spelling. Demonization. If you've seen the video of Rodney Howard Brown and, and Kenneth Colt, that, that stuff's demonic, isn't it? It's not just carnal, it's demonic. It's demonic. Demonization. For want of the Holy Spirit, they get another spirit. The problem is people couldn't discern the two too easily. What did they say? Is Saul among the prophets? Look at the next verse. Verse 15. Saul's servants then said to him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God is terrorizing you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you. Let him seek a man who is a skillful player on the harp. And it shall come about when the evil spirit from God is on you, that he shall play the harp with his hand and shall be well with you. Point one is that it is from God. It is from God. In Isaiah, even Satan is called God's servant. Remember Ahab, God sent the lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Antichrist, the Lord himself will send a delusion that they may believe what is false. Zechariah 11, the deceiver in the last days is God's mighty agent. You want to be deceived? Oh, God will send you a deceiver. In the world to come, people will be judged for their sin. Our sin as Christians who've repented and accepted Jesus, our sin has already been judged on the cross. Okay? Our sin has been judged. I'm talking here about unsaved people. In the world to come, unsaved people will be judged for their sin. In this life and in this world, they are judged by their sin. You understand? You want to get involved with the demonic? No problem. Look at Romans chapter 1 very, very briefly. Verse 27, in the same way also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire towards one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the dual penalty of their error. In the world to come, unless they repent, God will judge people for homosexuality. In this world, they'll be judged by it. Their longevity is reduced by 25 years. You know the life expectancy of a homosexual? How, how, it's about a third less than yours of a practicing homosexual. In the world to come, people will be judged for their sin. In this world, they're judged by their sin. Our sin, of course, was judged on the cross. I'm talking about the lost here. And the backslidden, the unrepentant. I'm talking here about a soul. It was from the Lord. The Lord will send a delusion to make them believe what is false. You see, things like Benny Hinn in Toronto and Pensacola and all, those things are not simply deceptions. They are judgments. You understand? They are judgments. They're judgments. God's given them over to it. But it says, as often as the Spirit grabs him, it says the same thing in the Gospels. Remember when the, the demon was throwing the little boy into the fire? And his father said, as often as it grabs hold of him? When somebody's demon-possessed, it is not necessarily 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They come and go. 
Somebody's not always under the demonic influence directly. It's always a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's always in us, but it's not always on us. You can't prophesy or command somebody to get out of a wheelchair unless the Spirit comes on you in that instance and commands you to do it. Now, He always indwells us. Well, demon possession works the same way. It's the satanic opposite. It doesn't mean they're under the total control of a demon all the time. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. Is Saul among the prophets? He prophesied. Oh Lord, we did miracles in your name. We cast out devils in your name. Yeah, you did, and you did it in my name. Now get lost, I never knew you. Oh, he must be of God, he does signs and wonders. The Antichrist and false prophet will do signs and wonders. Jonas and John Brace did signs and wonders. The same Vanifla Oath, signs and wonders, miracles, healings, they never prove anything about anybody but Jesus. They never vindicate a man. They only vindicate the Lord Jesus. He didn't deny they did the miracles. He said, get out of here, I never knew you. Yeah, you did, now get lost. So what? Never said you know them by their gifts, said you know them by their fruit. Demonization. And when somebody is prophesying one minute, the Saul among the prophets, and under the influence of a demon another, an undiscerning person will not be able to always tell the difference. So it must be the Lord that he's acting like this and doing this. <laughs> you understand how it works. Now at this point, what Saul desperately needs to do is have his sin dealt with. What he desperately needs is have that demon dealt with. We're talking here authentic demon possession now. Not the stuff people call it today. We're talking about the real thing. Most of what you see today is not real demon possession. Although there is demonization for sure. Now, why are they calling it demonic possession? Will it begin come out of me and I begin to manifest? Again, it's hypnotic induction combo co combined with demonic. It's hypnotic induction combined with demonic deception. I begin to shake and I begin to do it. All it is is hypnotic on. Not one place in the Bible is the word ekbalo, cast out, ever used for a saved Christian. Why does the New Testament not teach it? Where is a demon ever cast out of a saved Christian in the New Testament? Never. Never. However, if you begin confessing you have a demon, you're opening a door that Christ closed. You're opening it. You're playing with dangerous things. Why did the apostles never teach it? As we always tell people, when I see a, a hyper-charismatic, when I see a Bill Sapritsky meeting, we have a deliverance service tonight. Call them up. You have a deliverance service tonight? Yes. Good. Send over two cheeseburgers with raw onions. <laughs> Don't forget the coleslaw. That's the only kind of deliverance service I'm interested in. Why do they not cast demons out of believers in the new? Why did the apostles not teach it? And all the instruction they gave in dealing with the world, the flesh, and the devil, why did they never teach casting demons out of Christians? Why? Why? Now, I think a backslider like Saul can be demon-possessed, and I think an unsaved person can be demon-possessed, but a Christian can't be. He can be oppressed. They have the Greek word is therapeo, not ekbalo. A demon can invade your body and your soul, but not your spirit. Different word entirely in Greek. Man-made doctrine. But when you reach this point, you're seeing demonization. The Benny Hinn is communing with the dead. If ghosts are appearing to him, if Catherine, that man is involved with demons. Okay. That man is involved with demons. Padre Pio in Italy. All this stuff, be careful. Now what do they tell him to do? Do they tell him to repent? No. Do they tell him that he has to have this demon delivered out of him or cast out of him? No. What do they tell him to do? They tell him to get some therapy. <laughs> what comes next? Psychology. Let me explain. Pay attention. Some of you know this, some of you probably don't, but we have to do it for the video. Psychology. 
Paul says, know ye not, ye are a temple of the Holy Spirit. A temple. The temple was a box in a box in a box. Paul writes in Thessalonians, May the Lord sanctify you in body, soul, and spirit. You had an outer court of the temple. You had an inner court. And you have the Holy of Holies, the Sanctum Sanctorum, what we call in Hebrew the Kodesh Kodeshim. That's outer court corresponds to our body. Hebrew, goof. Greek, soma. The inner court corresponds to our soul, our consciousness, our mind, emotions, intellect, things of that nature. Will. What is the soul? Hebrew? Nefesh. Comes from the it's anomanopia. Well, we call it in English, we don't call that in Hebrew. It sounds like what it is. Breath? Nefesh. 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 It's anomanopia. Greek? Psuche. Psuche. Get the word psychology or psycho, soul. Body, soul, but then there's spirit. Our spirit where God's spirit dwells. Hebrew, Ruach, Ruach, the Holy Spirit. Harawaka Kodesh, literally the spirit of holiness. Greek, Pneuma, as in pneumonia, pneumatic drill, things like that. Pneuma. Body, soul, and spirit. We are tripartite. We are three-dimensional men and women. Biblical psychology is the book of Proverbs. Proverbs understands we are three-dimensional. Secular psychology is based on Darwinism. It says we're only two-dimensional. We are simply apes with bit better DNA. We're simply phylogenetically superior primates. We're two-dimensional. You have two basic forms of psychology. All the rest, directly or indirectly, derive from the two basic forms. One is the Freudian. Freudian would dismiss any spirit. It's all in your mind. Jungian comes from Carl Jung. That did see a spiritual dimension of man, but it had an occult view of it. It mixed the soul with the spirit. It's called the collective unconscious. And of course, Jung himself had spirit guides. He was a, an occult practitioner. Okay. So the Freudian and the Jungian are the two kinds of psychology. Psychology, secular psychology, takes three-dimensional men and women, made in God's image and likeness, where three-dimensional because God is triune, and reduces us to two-dimensional. For instance, in demonic possession, instead of the Holy Spirit in somebody's spirit, you have a demon. The word there is always ekbalo, cast out. Never used with the Christian. Ek, out of in Greek, balo, get the word ballistic, literally shoot out, throw out. Okay. That's when there's a possession. When it's oppression, you have a demonic invasion of the soul and the body. The word there is never, never ekbalo, cast out. It is therapeo, healed. He healed them. Can a Christian be demonically oppressed? Of course, Jesus was. Paul was. He could be demonically oppressed, but not possessed. Now again, when you're dealing with people who are biblically ignorant, they don't even want to talking about. He has a spirit of this, a spirit, well, what do you mean by that? You mean what the Bible does or something else? Okay. God says you have to put a new spirit in somebody and change somebody from the outside in. 
based on Darwinism, psychology says you change the environment and change somebody from the... God says you have to change it from the inside out. Psychology says you change the environment and change it from the outside in. Now we deal with this on the real gospel of health and wealth tape. We explain it in greater depth. But that's basically what it is. May God sanctify you in body, soul, and spirit. What Saul needed to do was be dealt with spiritually. Instead, they managed the symptom. Palliative care. Instead of dealing with the cause and finding a cure, they simply treat the symptoms. That's all. They treat the symptoms. They deal with psychology. Now, how do they do this? Why do they do this? Christian, the women of Christian America were psychologized by James Dobson, the ecumenical. The youth of Christian America were psychologized by Bill Gothard and his self-esteem movement. The men of Christian America were psychologized by promise keepers. The pastors of Christian America were psychologized by Robert Schuller, the protege of Norman Vincent Peale, the Freemason positive thinking guru, and the mentor of Bill Hybels. You have a psychologized church. What people today call preaching is not what the Bible calls preaching. You have three kinds of preaching in the Bible. Kerygma, didaskin, and homedia. Kerygma is preaching the gospel to the unsaved. Didaskin is expounding doctrine basically, and how to apply it. And homelia is exhortation. We get the word homily. That's what the Bible means by preaching. What these people do today and what they teach in theological cemeteries, I mean seminaries, particularly places like Fuller and places like that, is they're giving people motivational psychology packaged in Christian jargon. That's what the pastors do. If you work for a corporation you've probably been sent to a motivational seminar for management where they'll pay something in this country like probably five hundred dollars to go to a Holiday Inn or Hilton and some guy will come out with a very expensive custom tailored suit and a Benny Hinn haircut of it being a motivational seminar for sales executives God has given me a vision, hallelujah, for a church that will seat 5,000 people. It's going to cost $6.2 million, hallelujah. And God wants you to share in this great vision. So the motivational speaker will say, maximize the positive, minimize the negative. And so the parakeet Pentecostal will say, that's negative, I don't receive it in the name of Jesus. Reality becomes being negative. Sin becomes negativity. Not what the Bible calls sin. It's not hamartino or hamartino in Greek, or it's not het and pesha in Hebrew. They have their own definition of sin. They have the one from psychology, being negative. You understand? It's a psychology. In the early 1970s, following the breakup of the Beatles, John Lennon went through a personal crisis and he went to get psychiatric help in Los Angeles from a psychiatrist called Dr. Arthur Janov, who pioneered something called primal therapy, where you're a product of your pain and you have to relive your past painful experiences to become liberated from them. And John Lennon went through this whole thing about how his he saw a, a corrupt policeman who was drunk kill his mother with an automobile and get away with it because he was a cop and the courts were corrupt, probably Masonic influence, in, interference. And this gave him a hatred towards authority his whole life. Because he saw how corrupt the police and the law and the courts could be. And uh, how his father walked out and left him and how he was always trying to gain acceptance and recognition because he was unwanted by his own family. So he took to the stage and he, and he went through this whole thing. How he had to relive all this pain to become successful and to overcome it. So we get into the whole thing with the primal screams. Ah! People back in the crib when they were a baby and all this stuff is really nuts. And of course, all these film stars get into it from Hollywood. They begin going to Dr. Janov. 
This was called primal therapy. 18 months later, Ruth Carter Stapleton, the sister of Jimmy Carter, the American, former American president, wrote a book on inner healing. All she did was take primal therapy and put it in Christian jargon. Now, how does the Bible say you deal with past hurts? Two ways. One, you want God to forgive you, you have to ask him for the grace to forgive others. No matter what you have against anybody else, you're not God, you're not perfect. He is. He's willing to forgive you if you ask him for the grace to forgive others. Two, reckon yourself dead. Satan wants to dig up the corpse of the old man or the old woman, the creation, get you to live in the flesh, to gratify your emotions. So primal therapy says, well, you have to go back and relive it and then bring Jesus into it. That abused child or abandoned wife or sexually abused little boy or little girl, they're dead. Reckon yourself dead. He's dead. She's dead. Reckon yourself a new creation. That's biblical psychology. They're dead. Psychology says, no, they're still alive. They have to hurt you. It has to be dealt with. And so this gets into the church, and they call it counseling. It's not counseling. It's garbage. It's rubbish. It's filth. It'll put you in bondage. It's just a lot of filth. Well, it's more than filth. It's money-making filth. It's a good business for the con artists who propagate it and for the ignorant who subscribe to it. It's not biblical. Biblical psychology is Proverbs. Now let's look. Biblical philosophy is Ecclesiastes. Biblical psychology is Proverbs. Now let's look. Inner healing, motivational psychology. Hello, my name is Rupert. Hi, Rupert! And I'm a recovering alcoholic. Hello, my name is Hazel. Hi, Hazel. And I'm a recovering compulsive gambler. My name is Jacob. When I was a teenager, I was strung out on cocaine. I'm not a recovering cocaine addict. That guy's dead. I'm a new creation in Christ. <laughs> they promise you freedom. They put you into bondage. Instead of reckoning the old person dead, dig them up again, get the shovel out. We'll deal with your problem. Get the shovel. Bring up the stinking corpse. <laughs> That's fine. Let the world do it. But when they do it in the church, you've got a problem. When I was first saved, you could walk into Christian bookshops and you see a lot of books on discipleship. Watch me knee, A.W. Tozer, Martin Lloyd-Jones, good stuff. Good to this day. The classic stuff's always going to be good because it's true. It's biblical. A lot of books on discipleship. Today, you won't find many books on discipleship. You'll find books on counseling. You would have found books on a lot of good subjects at one time. Today, you find books on no longer screw tape letters or the Pilgrim's Progress. They have to order that special. Today's books you'll find on uh, Seven Steps to Prosperity, Five Keys to Victory. <laughs> Psychology. It's a pack of lies. The Christian publishing industry is just that. It is not a ministry. It is an industry, just like the Christian music industry. Don't Look, if it's an industry, call it what it is, a business. Most of these companies are owned by secular conglomerates anyway. Word publishers, Zondervan, they're all owned by secular interests. And, and Zondervan's not the worst. Harvest House is going, it's compromising. Call them what they are. Call them businesses. Don't call them a ministry because they're not anymore. They're businesses. It's not what's biblical, what's going to help people, what's honoring to Christ. It's what's going to sell. They'll sell anything. Fear the people. The people want it. So they get into psychology. The eighth step towards witchcraft. Now very briefly, turn back to chapter 15. Verse 23 
Rebellion is as the sin of divination, Kesem witchcraft. Notice it was years later, years, until King Saul actually went to the witch at Endor. It was years before she went into overt open witchcraft. Years. But God called it witchcraft from the beginning. God knew what it was from the beginning. As soon as you see this pattern, it's witchcraft. It was years later that he openly did it. But it was not so shocking once he openly did it. Pay attention. How can Benny Hinn say there's ghosts appearing to him in the room and people still go and get him to lay hands on them and give him money? How can people not see through this? That began years later when they began saying it's okay to stay in the Roman Catholic Church and pray to the dead even though God calls it the sin of necromancy. It goes back 30 years ago to David Watson and these clowns. Michael Harper was telling people to stay in the Roman Church. Goes back 30 years. How can Christian educators, Christian parents, be telling Christian parents, have your kids read Harry Potter? It goes back 30 years. It's the natural result of this very pattern, you understand? God called it witchcraft from the beginning. Let's read further. What comes next? Once they get into psychology, well, we know what comes next. Everything becomes predicated on one thing, self-preservation. He goes into open treachery. Treachery. And these guys will get treacherous to protect their own interests and empires. Suing other believers in court who tell the truth about them? I've known cases where they've engaged in violence. I know a case in, in South Africa where Raymond called his bodyguards physically, physically, had to go with somebody who was trying to warn people outside Macaulay's church. Macaulay got divorced and remarried recently. Macaulay teaches that building the Tower of Babel is God's model for Christian unity. Treachery! But let's see what really happens. Turn with me, please, up ahead, and let's see what happens ultimately when they go this way. Samuel eventually dies. God removes prophetic warning. God removes prophetic warning. I no longer appeal to people like the leaders of the Assemblies of God. I no longer appeal to the Archbishop of Canterbury. I used to do that. I used to warn them. God told me to stop. Now I try to warn the people. I don't try to go to these leaders anymore. It's a waste of time. I know cases where people kept going to them and God took them. God took the Samuels home. There was one Samuel in, in, in America called Larry Thomas of Pensacola. God took him home. I believe he's the last warning the Assemblies of God were ever going to have. God removes prophetic warning. Eleven. The eleventh step of witchcraft. Verse six. When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. God stops speaking to them. Urim is the word for lights in Hebrew. God stops speaking. Until now is Saul among the prophets. 
Sometimes he was demonically activated. Sometimes he was activated by... God honored his position as king up to a point because he was still in the position. But God stopped speaking. He got one last stop. He goes to the witch. He goes into open witchcraft necromancy. Now it's open. But God called it witchcraft from here. God called it witchcraft from stage four. God knew what it was from the beginning. Does this pattern look familiar? How many people have seen this pattern in their church or in a church they were in? Yeah. They compromise. They set up monuments to self. Then they deny it and they get angry when you point it out. When they can't deny it anymore, they blame others. There's a false repentance, if there is one at all. What's really going on is a fear of man, because they're trying to build their empire. They need the numbers and the money and the people. And God ordains a split. Then they get more demonic. Just look at the videos. Big time into psychology, the Alan Davies syndrome, the Fuller's Theological Seminary syndrome, the inner healing syndrome, the motivational psychology, the Robert Schuller, Norman Vincent Peale, Bill Hybels deception. Then they get treacherous. When their empires begin to implode, they get treacherous. Look at Jim Baker, the biggest ministry in the world. He did this. The biggest ministry in the world, primetime TV, satellite TV, radio, the third biggest theme park in the world after the two Disneylands, Disneyland and Disney World. They're the third biggest. Christian Disneyland? It was unreal. The biggest ministry in the world. One day, Ahab and Jezebel down the drain. He got more and more treacherous. Saul always does. They lose their mind. God stops warning these people. He removes any prophetic warning. Then God just stops speaking to them completely. It's like in the days of Jeremiah. God says, don't even pray for them. And finally, they prove that God was right all along. What God called witchcraft way back here, now they just out and do it with Benny and his ghosts, with Harry Potter. Witchcraft. Witchcraft. You see, we call it compromise. We call it ecumenism. God calls it witchcraft. We call it euphemistically being carried away with the vision. More of a hallucination, but we say a vision. God calls it witchcraft. We call it psychology. God calls it witchcraft. What happens? What do you do? It took a long time for Saul's house to self-destruct. They run on inertia for a while while God builds up something new. And God is building something new in these last days. Not new. Actually, he's restoring something old. Biblical belief. Let's look. What does it say? Samuel said, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel and given it to your neighbor who's better than you. Hillsong can keep running on hype and inertia. The Phil Pringles of this world can keep their Anway programs running, if you want to call that Christianity. 
But they're going. Frank Houston is gone. Pat Mercedes is gone. Robert's liar and his gay lover are gone. They'll all go. Lest they repent. But it's not likely they will. What do you do? When this happens, what do you do? There's only one thing you do. Recognize what God does. It is time for a nice big split. God bless. Mm -hmm.